Merry Christmas. We can say it finally. It's so good to, to be here today to worship the Lord and for all of you, hundreds of you, maybe thousands over time online. We're so glad that you've joined us. You've heard it already. Our theme for the month ahead is to come home for Christmas. And maybe some of you are thinking, like a lot of these families, Jeff, I've been home almost nine months. I don't want to be home anymore. I don't know if your Thanksgiving was like me. I didn't quite gather with all of the loved ones we want to be with. Nine months, that's long enough to give birth to something. That's a long time. And, uh, and yet God has been at work in such powerful ways. We're calling everyone home uh, for Christmas. You know, they say home is where the heart is. I want you to think with me for a moment. Wait, where is home for you? I don't know if you'd say, you know, go back to, you know, I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina, born and raised there. Is that home for me? I became a Texan, got here as quickly as possible, married a Texas gal. Where's home for you? Is it a place? And, and if you go there, who's there? Who would be there? What would you do? Home is where you're known, right? Home is where you're loved. Jesus says that, that home is where you are fully known and fully loved. That's home. The Bible says that, that actually we find our home in him. That's the New Testament term that Paul and others use. In him we find our home. This is an amazing thing. Think about it. That home is not a place. This is a beautiful thing. It's not based on circumstance. Our home is actually found in him. We're going to talk about that throughout the month and throughout this day. It's found in him, in a person. Our hope is found in a person. Jesus said that if we abide, that's the word, if we abide in him, him. The message puts it this way, the, the paraphrase message, John 15, 4. It's, he says, live in me, make your home in me, just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear grapes, so we've talked a lot about the fruit of the spirit, can't bear fruit by itself, but only by joining, being joined with the vine, you can't bear fruit unless you are joined with me. And then he goes on, here's a key verse for, uh, for this series. Just a few verses later, uh, John 15, 7, he says this, but if you make yourselves at home, how beautiful is that? With me and my words at home in you, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. Jesus says, make yourself at home in my love. So we're calling everyone to come home to him. Come home for Christmas. You know, with all that we've made Christmas out to be, think about this for a moment. A lot of grief in this past year. Some of us are experiencing and will experience even more grief in the holidays to come. Because of losses, maybe literally we've lost loved ones. Or maybe I'm thinking Christmas is not going to be what we want it to be. But think about what we've made it out to be. We say this every year, don't we? That, you know, the crowds, all the, the people, all the presents, all the, the noise and activity, all the busyness, all the shopping and, and all the parties, the lights and presents. Don't get me wrong. I love Christmas. Like, like most of us, this is my favorite time of the year. But this year, I think we've been given a gift. Like everything that God flips around, we have an opportunity this year. To see if really Christ is at the center of our Christmas, if we're, if we're truly at home in his love, and that's the celebration and not everything else we've made it out to be. So I want you to consider this. Not only do we get to embrace the simplicity of Christmas this year, a baby being born, we get to show the world that that's what Christmas is all about. We get to show everyone, so, so consider this, what you miss most about Christmas, and it will come, you're, you're going to miss some things here at church, frankly. We're going to miss gathering together as we want to. We're going to miss some things along the way, but if Christmas is all about Jesus, you won't miss a thing because we find our home in him. 
Come home to him. Come home to Christmas. Today, as you've noted, we're starting out all the songs we've sung, the candle that we've lit. Everything is this sense of hope that there's something going on. There's a flow of history that's drawing us not only to Jesus, but also to the, to, to the hope of heaven to come of a new earth and a a new life and all things redeemed. I want you to see today that in him we find hope. This month, in him we find peace and and joy. In him we find love. I want you to come home to hope today. What would hope look like if you were to live with hope? That's what I want to talk about today. Hope is, is hard to get our minds around because it deals with the future. But today I want to make a connection with how it impacts our future, certainly, but it impacts our past And it impacts the present. Imagine if you could, like the biblical writers did, giving us images and pictures and words that would paint a picture of what was to come. Even as we've sung about today, uh, way back to Genesis and all the way through the Old Testament, the writers, the prophets pointed to Jesus and his coming. What if you could have seen 2020 before it got here? God did. But think about that. If we were to see it kind of, you know, Played out in front of us. Wait, wait, why is the queen looking at Harry and Meghan that way? They're surely they're not leaving the royal family. That's nuts. That would never, wait, and what is a murder hornet? What in the world is happening? And wait, what hap- what's up with Kobe? What, why, what are we, what are we, why are the hospitals filled up? Why is the, why is New York City filled up? What are, why are people wearing masks? What are these hazmat suits? What's up with the stock market? What is going on? What is, what's up with all the protest? Why is everyone angry? Why is depression on the rise? What's happening with all the anxiety? Why is everything shut down? Are you kidding me? Why in the world are people standing? Are these food lines? Are, these, are they looking for jobs? What happened in Beirut? Is this, what is going on in the world? Is all of California on fire? We could go on and on. Why are kids at home? Why aren't they in school? Why are we not worshiping together for months on end? Why all of the crazy? And what is a coronavirus? What is COVID-19? What if you could have seen 2020 coming? I don't know that any of us would have said, I'm in, bring it on. This sounds, this sounds wonderful, right? None of us would do that. God saw it. He saw it ahead of time, though many of us would want to skip it. He says, no, 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 this is part of my plan. Watch this, friends. You look at 2020, and many of us would say, things are falling apart. Your personal life today, you may say in this relationship or this, my life is falling apart. Listen, if you're in God's hands, he's sovereign over all things. Things are not falling apart. Things are falling into line, just as he has planned. You say, how in the world could all this be part of his plan? God saw it coming. And today I want to show you how our hope in a sovereign God changes how we live right now. The biblical writers say that he is from everlasting to everlasting. He is eternal. But but when we see these words in the Bible, listen, when you see the words like began or, or time or before, these are time words. These are for us, not for him. God lives outside of time. He is everlasting. I can say that time lives in him. He's outside of time. Think about this. Blows our minds. God dwells in eternity. You see, when you think about it, it may be possible to understand that God existed before he created anything. It's hard to imagine him eternally in the past. But we can kind of go, okay, he always existed. Then he created time or where we are and the earth and... He exists, but to say, watch this, to say that he exists now in an eternity past and eternity future simultaneously, we can't get our minds around that. What I'm trying to tell you is that God is beyond our comprehension and he is sovereign and he's in control of your life. Friends, listen, the hope that we have is in God and what he has done. And this God is all powerful. He's eternal in time and he's infinite in all of his ways. And he's in charge of your life. He is worthy of our worship. It's why the entire world right now should be worshiping him. 
It's why everybody in Dallas should be worshiping him in a church somewhere or online just like you are right now. Every person on the planet, if you were to see him, and to really capture who he is, you'd be worshiping him with your life. Do you realize that, that, that when I read the Gospels, what I see of late, uh, as I'm reading the Gospel, I see this phrase over and over again, so that the words and the writings and the prophets might be fulfilled. You see that 35 times in the New Testament alone, point, especially in Matthew, pointing to Jesus. Do you know that there are 29 prophecies fulfilled in the last 24 hours of Jesus' life leading up to his death? Do you know there are 300 prophecies in the Old Testament pointing to Christ and his coming? Manuscripts and writings that have been verified at certain times in the past that point to Jesus and all that would happen. There's there's an incredible book called Science Speaks. It's written by an astronomer, mathematician, Peter Stoner. And in the book, he offers a mathematical analysis showing that it is is impossible, and you know this, uh, that the precise statements about one person fulfilled, how about that, 300 prophecies, one person, and he takes the mathematical possibilities of only eight, only eight prophecies pointing to the same person. He says that it's estimated at one in 10 to the 17th power, one at 10 with 17 zeros behind it. This is to say mathematically impossible. And yet the Bible points us to him. What's my point? God is orchestrating all of history. And when we think and sing about the hope of Jesus, about his first coming, because he has come, he's fulfilled all the promises of the Old Testament for thousands of years. We can trust him now and we can trust him as we prepare for his second coming. As certain as he's come, he's coming again. This should build our faith, our trust in him means that it changes our our past, our hope changes our past. It changes the present and it changes the future. So I could have gone to, again, 300 different prophecies. I'm gonna go to one passage that you've already heard read today, a good portion of it. I want you to go to Isaiah nine, okay? So turn in your Bible to Isaiah nine. If you're at home, turn in your Bible. A real Bible is always good. Maybe you you use uh, an iPad or something like that. I'll show you the verses along the way, but I I want you to jump in with me here. Uh, Isaiah nine, while you're going there, so Isaiah is preaching uh, to the people here uh, in, in, in Israel. He's really challenging Judah now. Israel has fallen to the Assyrians and, and he's, he's prophesying, saying, listen, if you don't turn to God, you're going you're gonna to be punished even further. And, and Judah is about to fall into Babylonian exile. And so the divided kingdom is now about to be obliterated. And in Isaiah 8, uh, before we get to 9, in verse 22, he says that they see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. And they will be thrust into utter darkness. Sounds like 2020, doesn't it? Maybe worse. Fearful gloom. But this spiritual gloom over the people will be forever dispelled by the light of the Messiah to come. Look at chapter 9, verse 1. But there will be no gloom for her, Israel, who was anguished, I want you to see the verb tense here. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. So so the the invasion came from the north, the old, where the the tribes used to be, the the former 12 tribes of Israel. But in the latter time, he has, has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond Jordan, the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Now look at what he says here. In the former time, Isaiah's vision Okay, it projects his thoughts out of the tragic present into the future as if these things have already happened. So now the present becomes the past in his vision. All right, this is, this is the power of hope. Watch this. So, so it, he says here, Isaiah's vision, he, he, he sees what's coming. And Israel has been humiliated, a national defeat. And now he's saying the glorious new era The Messiah would launch his worldwide mission from Galilee of all places. Uh, Of all places on the planet, he's going to come and the remnant is going to be saved. And out of the remnant, he says in the latter time, a past tense verb, because he sees the future vision, he's looking back to the present. This is what hope does for us. Let's keep going. Look at verse two. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. 
Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has, has light shone. So in Galilee, Jesus brings light, the light of the world through his life, his preaching and ministry. And he's brought it to us. Look at verse three. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. Look at all this word, these words now. Watch, look at the shift. They rejoice before you with, with joy, uh, with you as with joy. So it's uh, just joy, superlative joy at the harvest. And they are glad when they divide the spoil. See, a surprising and unexpected joy comes upon the people. A fullness of joy is springing forth from this remnant like a harvest. All that is coming. The first thing we see here, here's here's what I want you to see. First, I want you to see our hope changes our future. All right, so real simple today. You follow along with me. Our hope changes our future. Our hope changes our past and our hope changes the present. Look how it changes our future. Now, this might be the easiest part to understand. You think, well, okay, it's a future oriented because uh, hope is, has a future orientation. It's like what Paul says in Romans, for all of us who know Jesus, if you've received Christ, in Romans 8, 24, he says, for, this, for in this hope, we were saved. Notice the language again. In this hope, we were already saved in the past. Now, hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. He's saying, you don't hope for what you already have. Paul says you were saved, but it's not yet fully happened. You've been saved. You're being saved. It'll be fully realized in the future. But when you're trusting in Christ and the future he has for us, it's as good as done. As if it's already happened. Hope means I'm now living in the continuum of God's grace. His story for me, his future is as if it's a current reality. See, listen, friends, when you place your hope in what is coming, it changes the trajectory of your life. And here's what I mean when I say hope changes the future. All of us, watch this, I I, I hope to get home today. I hope from here I'm going to get home. Not only, watch, does that change my destination? I know my destination. It changes every step along the way. My future hope, certain hope, changes every step of my life every single day I'm living differently because my hope is in him and what is to come hope like faith I'm trusting that what he has said is true and friends every word in the bible is true you can trust it every single bit of it so our hope is in this future and this future now has changed the trajectory of my life now look at this not only that our hope changes our past And he said, well, how does this work? Look at verse four. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. What's happening here? He's saying God is a freedom fighter. He breaks all oppression. And the overflowing joy that is introduced now with a threefold four, okay? Watch this, F-O-R. Look at verse five. For every boot of of the tramping warrior in battle tumult. And four implied, for every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. You're thinking, what is all this, what is all this war battle language? Every boot, every army boot that's trampled on us will be destroyed. Every garment that is covered in the blood of his people will be burned up forever. He's victorious in every way. Everything will be redeemed. And friends, listen, the worst things that have happened in your life, whatever you're going through now, Whatever may come, God is redeeming everything in your life. If you're in him and your hope is in him, he's redeeming all things in your life. Everything self-imposed and everything brought about by others, God is redeeming. So it changes, watch this, hope changes our past in two ways. First, we look back and can see how faithful he's been. Now, we all can do this. We now, watch this, because of the hope ahead, we interpret our past with the trajectory of his grace and his divine plan and actions that are being played out now. So it changes the way I see my past. I thought that was the worst day of my life. It ends up being the best day of my life. That was the worst season of my life. Now I see what God was doing. Our hope for the future changes the past, but it also changes the past in this way. Look, secondly, our hope changes our past because we now view our past through the lens of a certain future to come. And here's what I mean. 
I'm no longer defined by my past. My failures of the past have been erased by his grace. I've said it often. I'm not defined by my past. In Christ, I'm defined by his past. And his past is perfect. I no longer have the punishment of, uh, and the wrath of God upon me because of my sin. I know that my salvation is certain. And so it changes how I look at my past. It changes everything about my future. But watch this. Finally, our hope changes our present. In verse uh, six and seven. Now, here's a verse you may know, right? We read this earlier. Here's the last four, by the way. This is the big, this is the big superlative four. This is the exclamation four. For to us, a child is born. Now, this is a real, if you've never read this before, this is a major shift. It almost seems like a non sequitur where you go, okay, I'm tracking, I'm tracking with you. a child is born. What? A child is born. To us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called. Everybody together. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. I love that. Again, the message says it this way. We're going to refer to that often. Just street language. Get it down to the simplicity of Christmas this year. For a child has been born for us. And this is, the, this is the perfect translation here. The gift of a son for us. In Latin, the theologians used to talk about the pro nobis of God, that he's for us. He, he's for us and he sends a son for us. Now, 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 we are for him, right? He's the creator. He is God. But look at what it says. He'll take over the running of the world. His names will be amazing, counselor, strong God, eternal father, prince of wholeness. Now we discover that hope, our hope is a person. We see that this is not just any person. And now Isaiah tells us how all this is going to happen. All of the hope that he's been talking about and this this coming victory of God and the Messiah to come. He says, it's going to come in a child, in a baby. The only frame of reference they would have had for victory would have been military power, political power. Unfortunately, like a lot of us, even in our day, it's the only way we're really going to change society is if my man is in the White House or my people are leading the way. And God says, no, I will not be co-opted by anyone. I've got another plan. Unto you, a person is coming. So look at this. Look at how he, he qualifies, defines this person. Our hope, friends, look, is a child. For us, to, a child is born. So 740 years later, we see in Luke 2, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior is born to you. He is the Messiah, which meant liberating king. He's the Lord. He's the master. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby baby you're gonna find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy 300 other prophecies pointing to Jesus the baby is the word of God John would say in chapter 1 14 the word became flesh and he made his dwelling among us I love what again the message says he moved into the neighborhood to be at home with us so we could be at home with him he's full of grace and he's full of truth our hope is a child a baby but watch this our hope is a son he's the son of david an heir to the throne through the davidic line but clearly he's more than that he's the son of god and he, he he's also a king our hope is a, a child our hope is a is a son our hope is a king he's going to rule over all governments He's going to rule over the entire world. He's sovereign and his mighty shoulders will rule the world with justice and righteousness. Perfect leadership. Our hope is a counselor, he says. The perfect counselor. Think about that. He's always right. Perfect advice. Never a wrong decision. You follow his advice every time. He never gets it wrong. He's a counselor and he sends his spirit to guide us every single day. If we'll trust in him. But watch this, our hope is a father. He's a perfect father. He's the 
father of the fatherless. He's the father of, 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 of those who, 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 who need a home. He welcomes the orphan home. He welcomes all of us home where the father is. He's the perfect protector and provider. Our hope, watch this, is God. He's, a, he's almighty God. Look at the adjectives that are used. He's wonderful. He's mighty. He's everlasting. He's just. He's righteous. He's going to tell us. And look at how he changes our present. Look at verse 7. Of the increase of his government and of peace will be no end. And again, that's not just eternal in time. It's infinite in all of his ways, his peace and his love and his wisdom on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness for this time forth and forevermore. And then I love this last line. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The the message says the God of angel armies has what it takes. He will accomplish this. Our hope in Christ changes our future, it changes our past, and it changes our present. So listen, this Christmas, every day of your life, place your hope in him. 2020 was so hard. It's been hard. Life is hard, right? And we don't know that 21, we have no promise it's going to get better. Sorry. But we don't. But we know that Jesus is better. We know that he never fails us because our hope is in him, not in our circumstances. And so in the book of Lamentations, you know, book all about lament, about grief, about loss. Lamentations 3, 28, 29, it says this. When life is heavy and hard to take, go off by yourself. Some of us need to do this today. We need to do it in in this season. Enter the silence. Bow in prayer. Don't ask questions. Wait for hope to appear. It'll come. His hope will come. So how does this happen? First, you need to remember. Today, as we really apply this message, before we go, remember. Never forget that he's trustworthy and true. I love what it says in Job 8. Bill Dad is one of Job's friends. He's basically saying, what is wrong with the world? Like all of us, just stop the world. I want to get off. And then he says this. Such are the paths of all who forget God. The hope of the godless shall perish. It says, it says in the message again, it says those who forget God have no hope. Friends, there's an axiom at work in your life and mine. As I forget, the further I move away from God, the more I forget him and who he is, the less hope I have. But the converse is true. The more I draw near to him, the more hope I have. And the greater the power that comes into my life. Our hope is not found in a better job, more gifts, and not found in politics or certain leaders, not found in our security. It's not found even in our families or all that we want Christmas to be. Our hope is found in a person. And his name is Jesus and he is the king. And our hope is in his kingdom to come. When, when the Bible speaks of God's kingdom, it doesn't, it's not simply talking about some, you know, beam us up and get us out of here as we watch the world burn behind us. Jesus, when he talks about the kingdom of God, he's talking about here and now. Yes, everlasting. But he's talking about now. And he says, the zeal of the Lord will do this. What is this? It's bringing his kingdom to earth is what it is. You can count on it. It's done. And as we live for him, his kingdom comes in our lives and through us to others. It's like your salvation. It's as good as done. And friends, listen, if you're online watching me right now, maybe you're in this room, you don't know if you're saved or not. You don't know that you know that you're gonna go to heaven when you die. You can be certain because the difference between religion and Christianity. How about this? Every other religious leaders that come down the pike and every religious leader that will come, the difference between everyone else and Jesus is this. I say it often. The difference between religion and Christianity is do versus done. Religion says do this and do this and do this and do this to appease a holy God. Are you kidding me? You can do enough to gain the approval of a holy God. There's no way. But Christianity says, done. 
It is finished. It's complete. It's why Jesus said on the cross, it's finished. Everything necessary for our salvation was done. It's why Isaiah would go on in Isaiah 53. He would say that he was pierced for our transgressions. Friends, listen, again, 400 plus years before Christ came, before the crucifixion was even a form of punishment. He was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that brought us peace. And friend, if you've never received Christ, by faith you can receive his grace and the promise of salvation for what he's done in the past that can change your life in the present, that can bring about a brand new future ahead. The trajectory of your life, when you receive Christ, completely changes everything changes. We join him, watch this, in pulling the future into the present and we become the answer to his prayer that that, that the will of God, the kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven right now. As we live for him in obedience, Jesus and his resurrection has changed everything. Everything, everything now has flipped in in Surprised by Hope, a wonderful book by N.T. Wright. He writes this, belief in the bodily resurrection includes the belief that what is done in the present in the body by the power of the spirit will be reaffirmed in eventual future, in the eventual future, in ways at which we can presently only guess But friends, what the Spirit is doing in us now is is pulling the future. I love what he says. He also says this. I think it's in this book. N.T. Wright says that God in Christ stepped out of the future, out of the fog of the future, into our present to show us what it's going to be like. The resurrected Jesus is the first fruits among those who will follow him in a triumphal procession, resurrected into a new body on a new earth, worshiping a resurrected Savior for eternity. Friends, that is where history is heading. Let the scriptures tell you where history is heading and no one else. And trust in the word of God. His will be done in your life as we live for him. Then he starts to do something very different through his people. So imagine 2020 again, maybe through the eyes of God. He saw it coming. He saw it all coming. So, so some of the images we, we would have seen would have been very different than those that we have seen before. We'd see people serving one another. We would see people loving others. God saw this coming. There would be people in need, but his people would rise up. They would go serve at places like Cornerstone and Jack Lowe. They would see see needs down down in the the southern sector or the east or the west, different parts of our city. He would see people gathering together saying, we can't but get together. We're going to figure out a way. We're going to help those in South Texas who have great need. And what about the first responders? All the people who cared for us. We, we, we were able to go online to pivot, right? To shift and to say, let's, let's proclaim the gospel to the world. Let's do whatever it takes. Let's keep pressing on and trusting in him. Let's reach the nations for him. And so God allowed us to do all these things. He saw it coming. And this is true in your life and in my life. Because of the generosity of his people. Because we have our antennae up constantly. Because the Spirit shows us there are needs in this world. We can pull the future into the present when we follow after him. Friends, this is a foreshadowing. You see it? It's going to happen in your life this week. You're going to have opportunity to serve. It's a foretelling in the here and now of what is to come. Our hope in Jesus. It changes our future. It changes our past. And it changes our present. And my great hope for you is that you receive Jesus Christ right now. If you don't know him, you're in this room or you're watching online. I want you to hear this. There is a home for you. And that home is found in him. And the plea today as I close is not from a pastor saying, please come home to Jesus. It's from Christ himself. 
It's the spirit of God. If you're watching online, you've never made this decision. It's why you're watching right now. He's calling you in. And I want to say this to everyone who lives in Dallas and everyone here. Home is the place where you belong. And this place, you belong here. You belong here where everybody's somebody. This is a beautiful church home. And we'd love to connect with you to help you join this family of faith. Even now, what a great time to join the family of God. So I want us to pray together, everyone in the room. And if you're a believer, maybe you're at home, I want you to pray for everyone watching right now who does not know Jesus, who's never made a decision to place their trust in him. So let's all bow our heads and just close our eyes. And you may be home alone. You may be with others, but now's the day. This is your day to give thanksgiving to God for all that he's done for you. He's done everything possible. Now all you must do by faith, praise God, not by works, receive by faith, just believe to say, Lord, come into my life. Make me the person you've created me to be. I give you my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Thank you for being my hope, my savior, my counselor, my king. I give you my life. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.